Uh, let's take our Bibles, go back to the book of 2 Samuel, a couple of chapters forward from where we were this morning. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 20. Trust in the Lord to help us again from His Word. And uh, I found a good deal of, of uh, enjoyment in studying through uh, the life of David. And certainly uh, and on Wednesday nights, we're just getting started. The life of David preaching on the types of Christ. In fact, last Wednesday just introduced David as a type of Christ, ran through a lot of information and a lot of different similarities there in, in David's life. Uh, and then this morning, of course, the message dealing uh, with David and his desire that came a little too late in life. He desired to die for Absalom uh, when he should have died a long time before. As far as the crucified life is concerned, we ought to die so that we can raise our children. We ought to die so we can be good husbands. We ought to die so we can be good uh, wives and pastors and whatever, whatever ministry you have, whatever God has for you to do, the crucified life is the only way to accomplish the will of God in your life. And uh, so appreciate what God did for us this morning. Now, we want to go to 2 Samuel chapter number 20. I want you to stand with me as we read. We're going to read, start reading in verse number 4 and read several verses here. And uh, it may seem odd that I'm just reading this passage of Scripture, but I trust by the time we finish with the message, the Lord will have helped us, and you'll see the, uh, the wisdom in reading this particular passage of Scripture. The Bible said in verse number 4, Then said the king to Amasa, Assemble me, the, the men of Judah, within three days, and be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba the son of Bechariah uh, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. There went out after him Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men, and they went out to Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bechariah. I'll pronounce that different every time I read it because I don't know how to pronounce it. Amen. And as soon as I find the one that really fits it, I'll do that the rest of my life, but I hadn't found it yet. Verse number 8, When they were at the great stone, which is at Gibeon, Amasa went before them, and Joab's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened unto his loins and the sheath thereof. And as he went forth, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bichri. And one of Joab's men stood uh, by him and said, He that favoreth Joab and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. Mesa wallowed in blood in the midst of the highway, and when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Mesa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him when he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would please speak to our hearts. Lord, you know the message, the thought that you put on my heart. I pray that you would please make it clear, make it plain as only you can. Lord, as you preach to me, I pray that you would preach through me now. Use me as a vessel to preach the Word of God. Guard my lips. Help me not to say anything I shouldn't say. Lord, please give me boldness and liberty to say everything I should say. And I pray that you would help us, Lord. I beg you to do a great work for the glory of God. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Uh, in this passage of Scripture, it's a familiar story. If you're familiar with the life of David and you've read your Bible, it's one of those stories that uh, stick out in Scripture, not necessarily because of the prevalence 
prevalence of it. It's not a recurring theme throughout Scripture in any way. Uh, however, but when you, when you read of someone being killed, and specifically the Bible said that they wallowed in their blood in the middle of the highway, there's just something about maybe, maybe I'm just of the gory nature, Brother Ken, but there's just something that stands out about that particular verse as you read it. That is not something you normally read in Scripture, a verse that is so descriptive as to the scene that we have before us this evening. And uh, I'm really not, uh, not going to, and I'm not interested in examining the ins and outs of this particular happening. Uh, I'm not going to take a side and say that Joab was right in what he did. I'm not going to take a side and say that Joab was wrong in what he did. All right, uh, I'm simply going to say that it happened and it presents us a truth that if we can get a hold of, I believe will help us as we look at this passage of Scripture. Basically what we have, we have Joab coming against Amasa. Amasa was Absalom's captain. When Absalom revolted against David and, and all that tragic event, some of which we dealt with this morning, uh, Absalom appointed Amasa after David had fled for his life and fled Jerusalem, Absalom appointed Amasa to be his captain. So we know Amasa has had some loyalty issues in regards to David in the past. Now, maybe this is where uh, everything stems from between Joab and Amasa. Perhaps as David, when he came back to Jerusalem, which we'll deal with in a moment, uh, David told Amasa that he would have the captain's position, and maybe that is what led to Joab's uh, situation and what happens here. I'm not going to say one way or the other. What I am going to tell you is the scene that plays out before us is in a road that is traveled by people. There is a, there, there is a dead body now that is laying in the road and everybody as they walk by this dead body stops to look at him and to gawk at him and progress is stopped because of this dead body body that is in the roadway. So I want to look at this road for just a moment, point out two things about the road that we can see in this scripture, and then try to bring an application that I believe will help us. If you go back to chapter number 19, you're going to find that this road that they were on is a road of revival. I believe this is a road of revival. David has had his ins and outs. He's had his ups and downs. David has been blessed to the Lord. David has sinned. David has been, uh, David has been promoted. David has uh, faced great heartache. David's been all over the map in the last few chapters from chapter number 11 on. It's been up and down and all in and out. Some horrible things have happened in David's life. Some great things have happened in David's life. And now we have Absalom has died and he's now off the scene. They're no longer worried about Absalom leading a revolt against David. David, as far as that is concerned, is safe from from harm, and now they begin a road of revival to get back to some normal lifestyle, some normal kingdom, some normal type of rule, and that's what we find in chapter number 19. You will notice this road of revival involves several things. It involved repentance. In verse number 9 and 10, you find the repentance of Absalom's followers and all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us out of the hand of our enemies and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines and now he has fled out of the land for Absalom. And Absalom, who we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? Uh, Absalom's followers, now David has run for his life and they rose up and they anointed Absalom to be king. These are men that were faithful to Absalom, but here's the problem. Absalom wasn't supposed to die. Absalom was the one protecting them from David because they turned on David when David left. But now Absalom is dead, and who are they going to turn to now? They said, hey, the best thing we can do is get right with David. 
Best thing we can do is turn our heart and say, hey, David, we're sorry for what, you, what we have done. We're sorry that we anointed Absalom. We're sorry that we followed him. Why don't you come back and be king over us? This road of revival, can I tell you what it involves? It involves us getting over some really bad decisions that we've made and going ahead and get back to the original king and saying, I'm sorry I left you. I'm sorry that I was not devoted to you. I'm sorry I turned my back on you. But Lord, if you'll come back and rule over me, I want you to be king again. I want to be right with you. It involved repentance. And my dear friend, if you're ever going to see revival, if a church is ever going to see revival, if America would ever see revival, there would have to be an awful lot of repentance over the fact we have departed from a king. And we'd have to get back to the place we were willing for the king to rule over us again. Not only do we find the, the repentance of Absalom's followers in this road of revival, we also find the repentance of Shimei. Shimei in, in chapter number 16, I believe it is. Maybe, maybe it's not, but let me look back real quick. Chapter number 16, yes, verse number 5 there. You find the story of Shimei. And uh, Shimei curses David. As David is leaving and running for his life, Shimei curses him and, and calls him all sorts of names and tells him that he's not the king and he's not God's man. He goes into all of these things. Well, now here's the problem. Absalom died. And when Absalom died, now David is going to be king again and Shimei is in a real mess. It's one thing to curse a king when he's running for his life, but when the king's turned around and coming back to rule, it's a whole different story. And Shimei mans up, he faces what is going on in verse number 19, verse number 18. And there went over a ferry, in chapter number 19 now, verse number 18. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as, was, as he was come over Jordan. Notice what he said unto the king, Let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither did thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my Lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first this day to all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord the king. He said, David, I've got to get right with you. Hey, listen, I can't let you come back up to Jerusalem and rule without me being right. I don't want to hide the rest of my life. I don't want to run around the rest of my life. I don't want to be able not to serve you. I don't want to be in the place where I can't show my face. David, the best thing I can do in this road to revival is just admit I have sinned sin. I did some wrong things. I was not faithful to you. I cursed you and I want you to know I'm sorry and I'm begging you to forgive me. Please don't lay it to your heart. Oh, how many times have I found myself falling at the feet of the Lord Jesus Say, Lord, please don't take it to heart. I was foolish when I said those things. I was foolish when I turned my back. Oh, God, please don't put it on your heart. Don't take it to heart. Hey, don't lay my iniquity upon me. Please Lord, put it under the blood. Hey, friend, if you're going to see anything called revival, there's going to have to come a time of repentance in our life, a time when we're just getting right with God. Absalom's followers repented, Shimei repented. So we see on this road to revival, there is repentance. Secondly, on this road to revival, there's also a return of authority. Repentance was only half. Repentance was saying, hey, I'm sorry for what I've done. But now David is going back up to Jerusalem in verse number 14. Chapter number 19, verse 14, the Bible said, And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word unto the king, Return thou and all thy servants so the king returned and came to Jordan. Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to conduct the king over Jordan. There is a return of authority. Can I tell you, dear church, can I tell you folks, families, uh, moms, dads, children, everybody that's here, anybody that's listening or watching, uh, anybody that's under the sound of my voice right now, if you repent of your sin but you refuse the authority back into your life, you're still never going to see revival. Revival comes from 
saying, Lord, I'm sorry I turned my back on you, but now I want you to rule over me again. I'm not going to ask questions about it. I'm not going to complain about it. Just come back and rule. Hey, I've got a throne that's been empty way too long, and I don't like an empty throne. I've not had the authority that I needed in my life, and Lord, my life's falling apart, and God, I'm begging you to come back and sit on the throne of my heart once again and rule and reign me the way that you're supposed to and I'll submit to you and I'll live for you and I'll obey you and I'll be a good servant to you. Lord, if you will just come back and reign over me again. There's a return of authority. There's repentance on this road to revival. I like this. There's reconciliation on this road to revival. I'm not going to take time to read it all, but in verse number 24 through verse number 30, we find Mephibosheth. Oh, the story of Mephibosheth. I'm telling you, if there's ever been a story of the grace of God in the Old Testament, it's the story of Mephibosheth. How Mephibosheth was made crippled by a fall. Yeah, man, they, they got up to run one day and Mephibosheth fell. And when he fell, he became a cripple. He could do nothing else. But then that cripple who was made crippled by a fall, he was invited to come be a part of the king's family and to sit at the king's table. Oh, my dear friend, if that's not a picture of redemption, we as mankind were crippled by the fall of man when Adam fell in the garden, but we've been invited to feast at the master's table. And he said, hey, pull up under the table. Nobody will see your infirmities. Nobody will see your weaknesses. Nobody will see your failures. Nobody will see your problems if you just tuck them up under the table table of God and feast from the goodness of the Lord. Oh, the story of Mephibosheth. Now Mephibosheth, as David has been gone, Absalom's been ruling. Mephibosheth was not in, in a condition to travel, and his servant lied to him. So now Mephibosheth has been. But you, I want you to notice Mephibosheth has proof that he never followed Absalom. The Bible said, and it was in verse 24, the Bible talks about the fact that he had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. You know what that means? Every day Mephibosheth longed for David. Every day they were apart. Brother Philip, there was something in the heart of Mephibosheth. His servant would come to him and say, hey, uh, Mephibosheth, you want to get a shower today? Oh, no, not till I see David again. Hey, you want to change clothes and wash up a little bit? No, not till I see David again. Hey, would you like a, a little trim on the facial hair? Not till I see David again. He was in a full-fledged state of mourning because he was upset that his king was gone. And can I tell you, dear friend, if you ever get to a place where you can't feel the presence of God and you can't sense that he's close, if you're right with God, it'll put you in a state of mourning and you won't be interested in anything else but seeing him. But thanks be unto God when David comes back to Jerusalem. Mephibosheth comes down and meet him and said, oh, I've been waiting to see you. It's been too long. I didn't like it. I've been a miserable man. Look at me. I'm a wreck. But thanks be to God. God has brought my king back. And I want you to know it's a happy day in the road to revival when you feel the breath of God blow on you again and you feel a breeze from another world come down and begin to stir in your soul and the good water of the word of God begins to swell up within you. It's a good day on the road to revival. We're on the road to revival. There's repentance. There's a return of authority. There's reconciliation. I wish I didn't have to mention this, but it's on the road to revival. There's nothing we can do about it. On the road to revival, there's resistance. On the road to revival, the last three verses of chapter number 19, you find the men of Israel in contention with the men of Judah. Israel said, we've got a bigger part invested in the king than you do. We've got more tribes invested than you do. We deserve to have more right to the king than you do. Judah said, no, we've been the ones that are faithful to him. We've got a right to the king, and you don't have a right. So there's been contention there between Israel and Judah now. And can I tell you, we might as well mark it down. If you're interested in the road to revival, and you're interested in God doing something in your own life, and in this church, and you're interested in a real heaven sent revival you better mark it down it is not going to come easy uh, everybody's not going to like it there's going to be opposition there's going to be resistance there's going to be people stand up and the arguments are going to be some of the dumbest arguments you've ever heard amen you know basically what this argument came down to brother Philip I've been saved longer than you've been saved 
Amen. I mean, that's the kind of petty argument this was. Hey, I've been saved longer than you've been saved. I got more right to God than you do. I've been in this church longer than you've been in the church. I've got more right in this church than you do. I've been a member of this church a lot longer than you've been a member of this church. So therefore, I've got more say. Listen, my dear friend, ain't none of you got any say and neither do I. All we're doing is waiting for God to show up and tell us what to do. And we're going to do our best to follow him. Somebody say glory to God right there. Hey, you say, well, I, I want to make this suggestion. Make your suggestion, but if we don't go with it, don't get upset. You say, well, I tell you right now, I've been a member of this church so long, you ought to listen to me. I agree. I told you we would. But just because we didn't choose to obey you didn't mean we didn't listen to you. Come on, help me now. Resistance, if, there, if we're going to be on the road to revival, mark it down, there is going to be resistance. Chapter number 20 starts with resistance. Chapter 19 closes with resistance. Chapter 20 comes in with resistance. And now we're introduced to Sheba, a man of Belial, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, who blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we an inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the, Lord, but the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan even to Jerusalem. Can I tell you, in this road to repentance, mark it down, there will be resistance. So see, this road that we're dealing with tonight is a road road to revival. Secondly, not only is it a road to revival, a road of revival, it's a, it's a road of rally. I like the term rally. We're going Saturday to a pro-family rally. I always like that. I remember in, in school when I was in, when I was playing football on, on Thursday afternoons, we had pep rallies. I always liked pep rallies. Because the purpose of a pep rally was to get together and pump everybody up, get them all excited about what we were going to do. Hey, man, you might go into a pep rally realizing and knowing that the other team was going to whip you. But by the time you left the pep rally, man, you could beat anybody. Might not always play out the next night, but you believed it when you left the rally. Hey, Amen. Why are we going to this pro-family rally? We're going to show the world that there are a group of people that want to stand, that are excited about the prospect of the God of heaven being able to do something in our country. And we're going to stand with God, and he's going to be our king. And I want you to know that's what this road that they're on is. It is a road to a rally. If you want to look with me in verse number 11, and one of Joab's men stood by him and said, He that favoreth Joab, and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. One of Joab's men stands up. He says, hey, fellas, let me have your attention for a second. If you're on our side, let's go. Hey, man, I mean, he's rallying up. If you're on our side, let's go. We've got a job to do. If you're not on our side, tuck tail and run. Do whatever you want to. We're not even interested in that. But if you're on our side, if you're supporting David and you're supporting Joab, then fall in behind us and let's go do something for God. I like rallies. I like rally preaching. Because you know what it does to me? It calls me out and says, hey, if you're on God's side, get behind us and let's go. I mean, let's just run with it. Hey, man, I don't like wildfire, but I do like fire. Some people are so scared of wildfire, they don't like any fire at all. I'm not one of them. I like fire. Hey, man, I like real hot fire. I like, real, I like real burning fire, and I like to get excited about the things of God. And I've been in some services, Brother Philip, where it got so good, man, I couldn't stand it. I'm telling you right now, if hell had opened up and I'd had a water gun, I'd have run inside putting all the flames out. If it had just given me a chance, man, I was ready to do something for God. Amen. It's a road to a rally. Let me say something about the road of this rally. There was a cause. Verse number one and two, we already read them, so we won't do it again. But Sheba has risen up against the king. Can I ask you a statement that we find in the word of God? David said it early in his life, early in his ministry when he was faced with Goliath. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? 
hey, I'm trying to rally you up, church. I'm trying to get you excited about things of God. I want you interested in the road to revival. I want you busy for the glory of God. I want you to get excited about the things of God. I want you to leave running out to your car in the parking lot saying, glory to God. I'm telling you, I can't wait to get up in the morning and serve God for another week. I want you to be excited. And can I ask you, is there not a cause? Is there not a lost person around the world somewhere that needs to hear the gospel? Right. Is there not a cause? Brother Jeremy, I'll encourage you. A lady that came in this morning sat right back here. She needs help. She needs help from the Lord. She was with a counselor, and that counselor told her, you need to get in a good church. She got home that day. There was a Harvest Baptist Church track in her door. Say, so why would you tell something like that? Because, Brother Hugh, I'm trying to rally them. I want to rally them. I want our people to be rallied. I'm trying to get you excited about the things of God. God can do those things. Hey, Brother Bill, do me a favor. If somebody gets saved, I know you're not keeping a record. Don't tell me how many. Just call me and say, won't you know somebody got saved by the grace of God? And I'll tell it to the church. Why? Because I want them to be excited about the things of God. I want them to know, hey, we can be rallied in the day that we're living. We ought to be excited. Hey, we are winners. Glory to God. We're on the winning side. And Jesus is coming again and we are going to be able to see him very soon. Thank the Lord. There's a cause. There was a concern. The concern is in verse number five. So Mason went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had anointed him or appointed him. You know what the concern was, Brother Jamie? The people that had been sent to do the job wasn't getting the job done. And that concerned Joab. And it concerned David. Brother Jeremy, that concerns me. You know one thing that rallies me and excites me about the things of God is because for too long there's been too many people sent to do the job that didn't get the job done. There's been people out there, pulpits are filled. You know one thing that makes me want to preach more than anything else, Brother Jamie, is the fact that there's pulpits all around the country that people are not preaching in. They're dissertating. Whatever that is, I'm not sure, but I think it's a word. They're getting up and they're, they're giving a, a, some kind of speech about a Bible passage and maybe they're getting up and they're teaching a good Sunday school and thank God for Sunday school lessons, man. But there is a difference between teaching and preaching. I believe preaching ought to be filled with teaching. I like teaching that's filled with preaching. But can I say our pulpits today are filled with a lot of men that have no teach or preach in them. And Brother Ken, that rallies me up because people are not getting the job done. And the fact that I hear there's pulpits out there where men are not standing and they're not preaching and they're changing their Bibles and they're moving the wood pulpit and putting a clear stand there. And instead of wearing a suit and tie, they're wearing a polo and blue jeans and they're sitting on a little stool and telling somebody that'll make them feel tell them something that'll make them feel good and they move the piano out and they got a praise band up there you know what that makes me do it makes me want to stand behind a wooden pulpit with a coat and tie on and sweat and slobber and shout and holler and say glory to God I'm going to preach the word of God and I'm not going to stop I'm never going to stop glory to God People are not getting the job done. It concerns me. So there was a cause. There was a concern. Number three, in this road to a rally, there was a challenge. Verse number 11, the challenge is given. If you're on our side, let's go. If you're on our side, let's go. I'll just go ahead and issue the challenge tonight. If you're on our side, let's go. If you're on our side, sit on the pew till you get bed sores. But if you're on our side, let's go. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Hey, you notice I didn't say leave. I never said leave. I said sit on the pew till you get bed sores. Hey, man, I learned a long time ago preaching to people is a whole lot better than preaching to pews. I know because I have done that. I don't want to preach to pews. I want to preach to people. And the only hope of you ever getting to the place where you want to do something for God is being under preaching. So by all means, don't leave. I mean, come in and sit on the pew. And if your heart's not stirred, just keep sitting there. And maybe the breath of God will blow on you again and stir you one more time. But hey, if you're on our side, let's get up and go. If you're interested in doing something for God, let's get up and go. If you're excited about things of God, fall in here and let's get up and go and do something for God. It's a challenge that is given. There's a conclusion. This road to the rally 
It has an end. There's a conclusion. Let me give you the conclusion real quickly. Verse number 22 sums it up real good. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent, and Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. Pretty good ending, isn't it? I mean, especially if you like me. I like that ending, Brother Scott. There's just something about that I find great joy in. I don't know if they had come over the wall or if they rolled it out the gate, Brother Richard. It don't really matter to me. The fact is, they give them the head. <laughs> and you know what that meant? You know what Joab said? Hey, fellas, blow the trumpet. Our work here is done. And the Bible said when the trumpet blew... <laughs> I just saw that. I didn't see this when I studied. The Bible said when their work was done, that the trumpet was blown. And when the trumpet was blown, they returned to their king. <laughs> That's what the Bible said. Hallelujah. Hey, church, there is a conclusion to this thing. It's not always going to be a road of struggle. It's not always going to be a road of battle. One day our work is going to be done, and the trumpet is going to sound, and we are going to return to our king. Oh, hallelujah, for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad, thank God, one day there's coming a conclusion. Amen. But here's the problem. On this road of revival, on this road of rally, something was in the way. Something was in the way. A mesa, Joab killed a mesa, and the Bible said that he laid in the highway, wallowing in his blood, and everybody that came by stood still. One of the men looked, and he saw that everyone stood still when they saw a mesa. So you know what he did? He got it out of the way. Something is in the way. What's in your way? What's in your way on the road to revival? What's in your way on the road of rally? What's in your way? Can I tell you two things about this that you need to understand about what's in the way? Brother Ken, it had already been dealt with. It had already been dealt with. Joab dealt with a mesa. Is that right? It had already been dealt with, Amen. and it was already dead. Amen. The thing that was in the way had already been dealt with, and it was already dead, but it was still in the way. There are things in your life that you have dealt with years ago. There are things in your life that as far as you're concerned are dead, but they're still in the way. Yeah. Brother Troy, I know so many people, they've got things they've dealt with. It's, it's not a matter of not, them not being right with God. They dealt with it. It's dead. They're not struggling with it anymore, but it's still in the way. And every time they see it, Brother Ken, the progress stops because they stand still. What is it tonight that is in your way? What is it that's keeping you from progressing on the road to revival? What is it that is keeping you from going forward on the road of rally? It's, it's most likely something that's already been dealt with. I mean, it's a Sunday night crowd. Most of us, um, as far as a church crowd of concern are probably the most spiritual, some of the most spiritual here tonight, Sunday night crowd. Wouldn't you agree with that? It's the faithful crowd, the Sunday evening crowd. You know enough not to let things live in your life. You know enough not to let things continue to rule your life, so you deal with them. And many of you have dealt with things, painful things, hurtful things, big things. And by the grace of God, you have slain them, and they're dead. You're not dealing with them every day. They're dead. They're not chasing you down. They're not haunting you. They're dead. But the problem is, they're still laying there. 
And every time you come up to it, you stop and stand still. As we stand at our feet tonight, every head bowed, every eye closed,